This is the Down to South London podcast, where experienced investor Jeroen Hopper talks to real investors south of the river. Lots of people say that you can't make good investments in London. Jeroen will talk to real people who are. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Down to South London podcast. And if you're watching this on YouTube, then uh, you'll see it's a, it's a lovely sunny day here in August. Um, it has been very, very warm. So I thought I'd uh, post a picture of the beach as the background, just uh, just as a little nod to the good weather we've had in this uh, corona lockdown time. Uh, today, Omar Mehmet is joining me. Uh, he's a fellow South London property investor. and um, We're going to talk about his most recent deal that he's done. Uh, some of you might know him from his YouTube cha- channel, Ohms Under the Hammer. So um, without further ado, here's Omar. Uh, why don't you tell us a bit more about yourself and uh, what you're doing? Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me. Um, my name's uh, Omar or Omer. I'm, I'm a property developer slash property enthusiast, if you like. Um, my, my main business actually sidelines of property is, is a mortgage broker. Um, and I've been doing that for the last 10 years. And um, something sort of clicked after two years of doing the job of just kind of thinking, you know, I'm helping uh, lots of other investors and landlords get very rich, you know, in property, um, flipping and doing buy to lets and all sorts of other property deals. Um, and, you know, I, I wanted a bit of the action, if you like. So I, I decided to ramp up my, my own property investments around about eight years ago um, when I started, you know, started to take property seriously, if you like, and, and not just as a side investment. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've been in property for the last 10 years. I, I started off my career working for quite a large uh, corporate company called Countrywide, uh, who own the largest UK estate agency chain. Um, where I was advising um, regulated and non-regulated mortgages within the estate agency branches. Um, I soon got very bored of doing that. And I, I, I'm from a family of uh, entrepreneurs and business owners and, and the micromanagement, I, I found quite difficult to be told what to do day in, day out and have daily phone calls with someone checking my targets and all that sort of stuff. So um, I broke away from that quite quite quickly. But have continued on with my mortgage career. Um, I own a, uh, a modest mortgage brokers in South East London called Trinity Finance. Um, we've currently got 16 active mortgage advisors within that business and a, a, a number of administrators helping us. So in terms of um, mortgage broking in South East London, um, uh, the business is quite well known, known now. We've been going for five years and have established a bit of a brand within that area. But more recently, um, a couple of years ago, I had my daughter. Uh, we had we had we had our first uh, child, and something just sort of a light switch just turned within me that just thought, you know, I I need to do something to try and really provide a good legacy for my family. So I, I ramped it up even one more step, step from there and started actively um, buying some more properties from auction. And I, um, my dad quit his his job. Um, and started to work for me in, in the building uh, side of things as well within the business. My mum works for me as a bookkeeper. Uh, my brother does our photography and drone photography and websites and all that. So it's a proper little family business of trying to m- make it all work. And touch wood, so far it's, it's going pretty well and I'm hoping to continue doing this for a long time now. And I, 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 it's, it sparked a little fire within me and mortgage broking some some stages i do enjoy it but it becomes very repetitive and um the the, the thing about property investing is that you never know what what the next day is going to hold i suppose and where your next deal is coming from as well so yeah that's a little bit about me really um well yeah just a little bit I, yes. I, I find it amazing that you're able to uh, keep it all in the family as it were yeah, so yeah. um the uh, the mortgage broking is uh, is very interesting. So a lot of people that I speak to um, obviously progress from some sort of property background into full time investing. Would you classify yourself as a as a full time investor, even though you're running a mortgage business on the side? Uh, my time now, it, when I first started doing it, it was heavily um, lent towards mortgage broking because unfortunately, a broking is one of those jobs that really sucks a lot of your time. And you can only key so many mortgage applications by sitting in front of a computer. 
Um, what I've managed to do over the last couple of years is, is ramp up the investment side of the business by um, delegating more of my work onto other members of my team. Um, I, I now have a full-time power planner that keys my mortgage application. So I very much still do the front end face-to-face -face, uh, consultation with my customers that, that come back to me as re repeat business for bridging, development, finance, commercial, and all sorts of quirky stuff that I do. But I tend not to get bogged down with the admin and that side of things. So, so what was uh, a strategy of probably I was spending 10% of my time on property development, 90 on mortgage broking, is, is very much split now 50 50 and I do you know I'll, I'll have a couple of viewings a week on potential property uh, investments that I'm looking at I attend lots of auctions virtual uh, auctions at the moment but physical when they were happening pre-lockdown um, I'm out and about making connections with various estate agents and part of a couple of groups online as well that I dedicate some some of my time to so yeah it's, it's 50 50 now and I enjoy that much more actually than um, just yeah. sitting in front of a computer and tapping away all the time. So, yeah, it's always the thing that I love the most about being in property is you, you get to go out and see them and, and do new projects and things. So, um, your your project, you've obviously got a good amount of cash flow coming in from your mortgage business, and, and well done for growing that to sixteen brokers. That's um, I'd, I'd imagine you're doing a really really good volume of business, and that. Yeah. that takes care of your sort of you know recurring income so yeah. your strategy from the looks of things is mostly to do with um buy refurbish refinance you've got an hmo project which we'll move on to in a, in a minute do you want to just keep building that monthly income or do you also do sort of flip deals whereby yeah you'll make 50 100 grand yeah. out of something yeah. I think um, when I first started doing this, I, I, I'd, I'd never had any education in property and, and hadn't been to any of these places where you kind of get taught various strategies. And for me, it was just, what can I try and do to make some money? Um, but the answer to the question in short is, I look at everything really. And um, so I've just sold uh, on the 30th of July at a London auction. I bought a property in South East London. Um, it was, uh, on the market and I was first in the door saw it was a cracking deal so speed was the the key aspect to securing it at a really good price managed to get the owners to allow me to do a exchange with delayed completion for three months so I secured it uh, and I split I did a title split and, and chucked it in the auction and, it, and the reason I did that is because I could see there was some complexities to going for planning and, and uplifting the value and doing various bits and pieces so I just decided to sell it on um, I, it's you know, as you probably know, it's very much a seller's market at the moment. The auctions are actually going crazy for stuff. I managed to secure uh, a really good lot position for both of them at a London-based auction, and 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 I, um, hopefully, if all completes on the twenty-eighth of August, I should make a hundred hundred thousand pounds pre-tax profit from one deal that I never owned. You know, what well, I exchanged, I haven't completed on it. So that's my first. Um, touch into a trade if you like I've never traded a property before because I've always had my dad there and the building team that's kind of been able to keep the costs down and never wanted to just flip it on to someone else and do, do the stuff myself my first ever property deal was a classic buy refurb refinance type structure but with a little cherry on top in that I managed to keep a little bit of land to the side of the property and sold that piece of land on without planning um, and yeah, I've done, I've done a few different things. I've done like a lease extension. I have made some money out. I've, I've bought five properties at auction since I started doing this, which have all been um, seriously below market value or had a little problem with them that I, I identified and could solve. Um, I did a HMO last year, just a, a small four bed HMO. I'm currently um, in the process of building out an eight bed HMO. So I'm, I think the thing about South London is we don't get inundated with property deals that are really good. There, there's, there's lots of deals available, but look, when you look at the numbers, trying to get a 30% below market value deal in South London just doesn't happen, does it? Unless you Probably literally, grail, you think, it? it's very, very difficult. Now, if you go up north, you'll find they're, they're all over the place, you know, and you, you get sent them daily, don't you? But so for me, it's, 
it's always been looking to find something that I could see an angle on that potentially was a bit undervalued that I knew I could do something with it. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where I've kind of got to the, where I am at the moment of having gained a bit of experience in trading um, HMO, uh, the auction purchases that I've done and just generally doing up properties and trying to hold them if I can, but if they don't work, selling them on, I suppose. Um, it's good that you've got multiple exit strategies. I think it's a, it's very powerful if you look if you're able to look at things. And a lot of the time, these opportunities present themselves because there's some kind of headache with it. And if you've got the knowledge to solve that headache or problem, as yeah. it were, um, yeah. then it, you know it, it's the age-old thing. If something's selling at yeah. 150 uh, because it needs work, it needs 50 grand yeah. worth of work. That that doesn't yeah. mean that's going to you know, it's not going to work if you're going to resell it for 200. But, yeah, you know, exactly. if there's a margin in there to be able to do the work cheaper or buy it cheaper, yeah. and there's a margin, you're using your yeah. brains to yeah. create that profit as it were. Well, and a bit like yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, definitely. I feel, I feel like um, I've managed to put myself in a position where I've got a few advantages. And one is that because I do the finance myself, I'm able to move extremely quickly on that front and i i've, I've financed a number of auction purchases using buy, uh, traditional buy to let mortgages and people tell you it's not possible you can't do it in the time frame and you need a bridge and blah blah well that is true if you've got a mortgage broker that's got a stack of 20 cases on his desk and you're just one of those cases but for my own ones it's actually all of you lot get off my desk i'm going to do this one so um mm -hmm. So, so there's that aspect. Then there's my dad that I have on payroll. And so I'm not paying a huge building company to spend a load of money on a refurb. I'm, and I'm really keeping in touch with that. Um, but just on what you just said there about like identifying a problem. So I'm just thinking um, out loud here. Last year, I bought a property from Clive Empson Auction in Kent, or down in, down in Maidstone. And the property was quite local to me. It was in Alpington in, in Bromley. And I, I went to view it and, at the, and there was quite a lot of viewings, you know, at the auctions you turn up and quite, quite often, more often than not, you'll have 20 people there all looking at the property at the same time. So this was last year. I'd gone, there's a big old crack on the back of this house. Oh, and I could yeah. see, I could see everybody was standing at the back going, oh, this, this, this is subsidence. And you could just tell people that. I'm not saying everyone's like that. Some people really do know what they're doing, but a lot of people were there and they were thinking there's some serious movement in this. It's going to need under, I heard the conversations. It's going to need underpinning. It's going to need this. It's going to need that. I stood at the back with my dad and quietly whispered, I bet you that's a, a cracked lintel. And I bet you we, they've not put the lintel in deep enough and we can solve that. And if we do a little extension out the back. We won't need to even touch the foundations. And he looked at me and yeah, I think you're right. Um, and, we picked that up at auction. Um, it was a three bed semi-detached house in Alpington. We picked it up for 265 grand, which is quite cheap for the Bromley area for a three bed house. You can't normally get them that sort of price just because other people were put off by that crack. And I sold sure. it really for about 1500 quid, the problem. Um, so, so that was quite a good one. And the, the other thing that happened on that was, that was quite good actually got to the auction and, when I, I got, I, I'm I just a bit of an enthusiast. So I just like to get to the auction early and, you know, have a coffee and enjoy the experience of the day and all that sort of stuff. And I, I got there really early. I think I was one of the first people there, um, just doing, doing a bit of work while I'm there and whatever else. And as the, the first part of the morning progressed, I noticed that the queue outside the auction was just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'd done my, AML well before and I previously bid there so they, they already had all my documents and I had my bidding card and whatever but the chap at Clive Empson said um I can't remember the time exactly but let's say the auction was to start at 10 he announced we can't start at 10 because we've got a massive queue of people outside that haven't registered yet and I need to get them in first before I'll start bidding because we haven't got through the AML process so this lot was being sold at lot number two and I was thinking just start it because if no one's in here more chance less competition course, yeah. out there. um so he waited half an hour but the, the queue even half an hour later was into the car park it, they just couldn't get people in the door quick enough so so i think i had a bit of an advantage of not having a full room when i bought that property and and so that that was quite good 
um, and, I, I, and I was in and out within sort of 30 minutes as well. So. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. So they did yeah. start with half the people in the car park yeah. still. Right? Yeah, yeah. Loads of people. But they had to get through the day, didn't they? So yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, he, he said 30 minutes and he started after 30 minutes. So yeah, yeah fair yeah, enough. Yeah, good stuff. Um, wow. That, that's amazing. So a little opportunity there for you. So you, you got that yeah. one cheap. You were able to, yeah. you sold that one on, did you? No, I've kept that. So I, uh, I used a bridging loan to buy it um, with a company called Precise. Well, it's actually yep. a bridge to let the product was. So I used a bridging loan with a guaranteed exit of a buy to let mortgage. Um, okay. I did a single story rear extension via permitted development, um, reconfigured the upstairs to have three good side bedrooms put a downstairs room and it was like it's a mini hmo basically four sure. four bedrooms i managed to let it to four nurses that all work at farnborough hospital in alpington and they're all friends as well so it's worked out really well because they're kind of cleaning it and they love the property and stuff um Good. but i refinanced it with a different lender that that, that valued it at four hundred twenty five thousand. so it worked out quite well in terms of the revaluation. I pulled out most of my money that I put in. I think there's a small amount left in it, but um, it's cash flowing quite good money as well. So I'm, I've managed to keep that one quite happy with it. And I, I hope I'll keep that for, but I've fixed it for five years now. So I've got to keep it for a while. So yeah, yeah. Interesting. So did, when you started out the investment, did you have like a business plan? Like, oh, I want to keep so many and I want to sell, just take as a <laughs> Just company. winging it, I think, yeah. Just bringing it. Yeah. Well, you yeah. know what? A, a lot of people go into business and say, "Oh, I want to do this specifically," because they don't have the knowledge on on other things. But I think, you know, having worked in estate agencies, both of us, yeah. you, you can kind of see more more deals than the average person. So yeah. I think uh, I, I'm very much in your camp, actually. When I see a deal, you you kind of know what to do with it or who to get involved. You know, because yeah. lease extensions I've done before um, got burnt badly because I took a punt that didn't pay off. I, I would definitely do one again, obviously, because yeah. um, there's success to be had there. HMOs, as you'll know, I've, I've done quite a few of those, and um, flips, I've done a few of those as well. So, you know, there's a wide spectrum yeah. of things that we have in common there. That's, um, that's great. Yeah, definitely. So, Sounds good. Um, my ethos is always invest close to home, and clearly you've been around the houses in South London. It yeah. sounds to me like we're on the same page there as well. What, um, yeah. what inspired you to stay closer to home as opposed to, and, and you did touch on it before, um, investing yeah. up north where you can pull all your money out and there's loads of deals, and why not, why not go up there? Yeah. yeah, so the honest answer to that is going outside of the area I know, it scares the hell out of me. I just, I, I, I'm, I'm scared to go to an area I know nothing about in terms of employment, house prices. There's just it being that distance that you've got to travel to and go and then sort out an issue. And right now I've got the connections that if there's a problem with something around here, I can just make a phone call and it's, it's done within 30 minutes, someone's there. Um, I, I grew up in... I was born in Catford. I then moved to a little village called Shortlands just outside of Bromley. Um, I live in Bromley now. I've worked in Catford and Lewisham for many, many years. And my main office is over in Welling in Kent. So I, I, feel, I feel like I know the area very, very well to the point where I'm sure most people would in South East London. But if, and this is probably from the mortgage business. If you give me any postcode with... Um, BR or SE, I can tell you instantly where it is. And I also know a lot of the streets and roads within those areas and kind of what the properties are around and what they're worth. So yeah. I, I don't invest in the whole of South East London at, or the whole of Kent, but I have patches within those areas that I know very well. And they're normally areas where I've worked in an estate agent for some time giving mortgage advice. So I did three years in Catford, a year in Lewisham, a year in New, Cro uh, New Cross, South London, a couple of years in Welling. Um, Bromley, I know pretty well because where I live. So and every time I've gone to work in another estate agent where I've given mortgage advice, I've done lots of transactions for people buying within that postcode. And I, I've got to know the area a little bit more and yeah. seeing what's there and what's not there. And that's how, that's what I feel comfortable with doing. Yeah. Uh, it's good, isn't it, when you can sort of you've got your finger on the pulse and you, you yeah. know the demand because you've already done three transactions on that road and you, you know they fly off the books and Basically, just, yeah. you're, you're confident to go into the auction and bid X because you know it'll sell at Y. So. Yeah. 
it's uh, yeah. it's invaluable information so yeah. um tell me about your youtube channel i uh, i was watching a couple of videos very slick you mentioned yeah. your brother does the drone photography really yeah. really nicely done because i was looking at the channel and i thought wow that's, a, that's yeah. some really good filming i'm, I'm, I'm yeah. writing down tips here as i speak but, <laughs> um, <laughs> what inspired you know, it, to get onto youtube it, it, do you know what it was it was more um just just filming a bit of a hobby really you know i did i didn't set the youtube channel up to be one of these kind of property educators that's going to preach about you should do this and get a good return on it it was never about that it was just kind of a so many people a bit that i speak to that are in property that kind of got this negative view of south london and london and you can't do it in london because it's too expensive and you can't get the deposit to buy it and you can't do, and i just thought well I've been doing it for the last eight years and it seems to be going okay. So I don't believe that. And I just thought, let me just kind of vlog some of the stuff I'm doing. And let, I, I wonder, what, more for my own enjoyment, um, I've got a lot of family in Northern Cyprus that I don't get to see very often. And they absolutely love it because they get to see a bit of what me and my dad are up to as well. And they all sit around right. as a family and watch it. Um, so yeah, it was purely a hobby. It was like just to break the day-to-day -day mundane mortgage broking and just show people a little bit about what I enjoy doing outside of that. And I suppose the longer it's gone on, the more I've started to think about it as a business, not in terms of like monetizing the income from YouTube, but just like building a bit of presence within the industry and maybe, I don't know, I I'm not intending to be like a Ranjan Bhattacharya or something, but just, you know, just, I don't know, just some something fun that people might enjoy watching and stuff. So um i don't know where it will go it's just one of those things isn't it so yeah the same like I, I put up the youtube for a bit of social profile and i think um i, I think it's helped to no end obviously and i love connecting people and, and yeah. part of the the whole youtube business um well business if you want to call it that is um yeah it's it's hobby and it's uh, it's great to get out there isn't it and show people your projects and keep them yeah, definitely with you absolutely ideal so no it's good i like the whole investing close to home ethos i'm very uh, very much the same and you know just like you just said there's so many people that think oh you can't do it in london because you're paying too much on deposits and stamp duty and all that nonsense it's uh, it's not true you can invest yeah. and yeah. make a good living in south london yeah. i mean if you're in manchester then by all means invest in manchester because it's cheaper yeah. there yeah. Um, but the point that i make with a lot of people that i meet is you can invest close to home you can invest in south london you know i know 150 property investors down the south london that are doing very very well um, yeah. You being one of them, and um, there's no reason why more can't do so. There's lots yeah. of opportunities, you know, for uh, corner plots to be developed or yeah. um, air spaces to be developed, more HMOs to be made, more houses to be turned into flats. There's loads of opportunities yeah, for exactly. lease extensions. Yeah, the list goes on. So it's just finding uh, the right stuff, isn't it? And I think. Um, you know, I, I get a lot of clients that come to me that are after a buy to let and some people are just they're very much just after for some something vanilla that they can kind of just buy rent it out get the yield and don't you know if you start mentioning the fact that they might need to do something up or spend any money on it, it just kind of all goes actually that's that's not within my remit and I've got a full-time job and I don't really want to get involved in that and my view's always been I'm actually, I've always looked for the one that's like, you know, the worst house on the best road type scenario. Um, apologies, I just had a call come in, I just shut that off. So yeah, always looking for like the worst, uh, the best, worst house in the best road or some, it's, a lot of the times it's been stuff that I've been able to get at speed. So I, I, I um, browse the portals, but looking specifically for certain things and looking instantly when they come up and then trying to view them within the same day or within the same hour, for example. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes that's the speed gives me a little bit of an advantage. The set, the second thing I try to do is where I've got as a business, Trinity's got relationships with 26 different estate agents across South East London and Kent. So I nurture those relationships and as and when there are properties that potentially have some problems or things that they might be referring on to auctions and things like that. I, I try to see if I can, have a look at those and see if I can make them work as well. So having those connections is pretty good. Yeah, um, yeah no, absolutely. Speed and connections makes a big difference yeah. to how many opportunities you're you're able to transact yeah. on as well. Yeah.
which is why I love the auctions as well, because I've had some transactions where I've still got one. I've got one now that I agreed to purchase over a year ago and I started purchasing it. And mm. I was about a week before I was ready to exchange and the owner died as I, as I was buying it. And he, he, was, he was an elderly chap and he, he had a power of attorney that was helping him through the sale and everything like that as well. So we then had to wait. And we're only just almost a year down the line. We're only just now getting to the point where grant of probate has gone through and they're in a position to sell it. So I think the, the, the um, nature of private treaty transactions is that anything can happen. And so I started looking more at the auctions. Um, and when I, when I did that, I found that you could put speed to, to the advantage there and complete on stuff very quickly. And, as long as you knew what you were buying and you were very careful and due diligence was done and you checked everything thoroughly, it, it, started, it allowed me to buy a few more properties quite quickly. So, um, good. yeah, good stuff. Yeah. yeah. So we've talked about your, uh, your strategy as in just wing it. Love it. Um, yeah. <laughs> talked about your most, re <laughs> most recent HMO. Do you want to just highlight the figures on that? Cause that's something that we hadn't yeah. touched on. The HMO. Yeah. So, so, um, Sorry, my, so I'm going to have to just turn that off because someone keeps calling my phone. It's interrupting this. All right, I've just turned that off, so they shouldn't be able to call me now. Um, right, so most recent, recent HMO, bought it from auction. Um, I paid 345000 for it. It's a three-bedroom semi-detached house. Um, it's probably, it was probably worth four hundred grand on the open market so it was it was significantly discounted anyway and the, the only real reason for that it didn't have anything majorly wrong with it it was sold by uh, l q housing association who started to shift a load of their stock at, at the auctions um, and it just it was just a bit tired and it wasn't lettable from day one so you could, couldn't get a buyer to let mortgage on it and it, it was either bridge or cash chucked into an auction because of the speed it put some people off so so probably 10, 15% under value from day one. Um, and, you know, that's, a, I suppose, a reasonable deal, but that, that was my intention when I bought it. The reason why I was attracted to it was because it's, it's actually very close to my main office, uh, Trinity Finance, where I run the mortgage brokers. It's almost on the same street, actually, but it's on a corner plot. And I saw the house next door, and, I, and, and Funnily enough, the house next door is actually one of my clients that I've done a remortgage on and I knew what her house valued at. So I did the, the refinance on it. I, she, she's got a five bed semi-detached house that she did a big wraparound extension on. And, I, and this one came up and I thought, I know I can guarantee, I'm pretty much guaranteed to get that, but I wonder if I could get um, a HMO there instead. And I, I knew that it, was, it could be a big potential because of the plot. Um, it's it's in it's in Welling in in Bexley and and it's an Article Four area there as well. So I I did take a bit of a punt because you know potentially it was never going to and it was half, half going to have to go to planning, but um, the refurb cost and the build is part double story to the rear, part single story. It's full double story to the side, so it's a massive wraparound extension and converting it from three bedrooms to eight bedrooms with six en suites and one shared bathroom. So wow. I'm pretty much doubling the size of the property. It's, it is, it's basically a shell. It's not really even a house. The roof's coming off. Uh, I've got a pass sound test. So all the, the walls are all being insulated. It's rewired, replumbed. Um, you know, there's a lot going into it. It's the furniture inside. I've got to redo the driveway. You know, I, at the moment, my schedule of work says I'm going to spend 150 grand on it. And that's even with me managing a project, having people working for me rather than outsourcing to a building company. That's quite and, conservative. That's not a lot of money for the amount of work that you just described, if you don't mind me saying yeah. so. So obviously using yeah. a family is, is a big yeah. saver there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the neighbour next door, she paid 150 grand to have her wraparound extension built. It has no element of uh, seven bathrooms with... And, and that 150 is including CCTV, doctor, lock doors on every, uh, sorry, locks on every doors, fire, it's everything that you need. So, so yeah, it's, I think that's easily, find. it's easily 200 grand if you, if you outsource it, I think. And so there's that bit. So I, I'm in a, um, when you work it all out, I'm in at about 520, completely done. And her house valued at six as a five bed semi. So when I work it out, 
on a, if I if I get a yield based valuation HMO valuation, and I think I should do because it's eight bedrooms, it's kind of not a standard house anymore. I'm hoping the valuation is going to come in about six fifty. Um, it it may come in slightly less because of COVID nineteen and mm -hmm. valuers are being a bit cautious and stuff like that at the moment. I can't see the valuation coming in at less than six because I think that's the bricks and mortar valuation. Um, yeah. But yeah. I, this one really was wasn't a buy it and sell it on it was a buy it do it up get the eight bedrooms let out you know and get some nice rental coming in it's also got this really big uh, frontage to the property that i'm gonna potentially block pave and, and have some parking there as well and one of the issues i've got with my trinity finance office is that i don't have any parking so i'm planning to keep two spaces there that i can keep for for, for our business to park some cars uh, from time to time as well. So there was that as an added benefit, if you like. Um, but yeah, it's That's really we're, good. We're, That's we're, really yeah, good. we're probably going to be four or five months, I would imagine, to finish it. So it's a big old project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I imagine so. I mean, the work that you just described, it's, uh, it's, yeah. it's massive. Um, and I, I believe I remember you saying you bought it about eight months ago. Is that right? Yes, uh, I bought so it in... No, so I the auction was about eight months ago. Yeah, funnily enough, uh, London and Quadrant Housing Association had a restriction on title that they wouldn't dispose of the property until a certain bit of uh, a certain charge that they had on the property was released. And so I don't think I actually completed on it until January, February time, uh, late January. Then I went to planning, which took a couple of months. Then the lockdown hit in, so I've just sat on it and I've only finished off another project and we've only just started about three weeks ago so sort of um mid july 2020 we started uh, and i'm okay. hoping to be done, sort of done and have the property ready for letting beginning of december this year okay okay yes uh, good good time scales all right um yeah. we touched on covid19 um you're mainly southeast london i'm mainly south West. I've seen room rents drop significantly here. Uh, we're talking 10 to 20 percent in some circumstances. Uh, single let rates have remained largely the same. Um, how have you found South East London rents in the whole uh, COVID pandemic situation? From my own point of view, I'm, I'm not particularly affected. My rents haven't changed much at all. I think that's probably down to the types of tenants that I've got in there and how I've really vetted them before they've gone in. But speaking to my clients that have buy to lets, um, in Kent specifically, I've had lots, I, I mean, I have a buy to let client of mine that has 450 properties throughout Kent and they're all single lets. And I, I, I manage his portfolio from a buy to let point of view in terms of the, the mortgage side, sorry. And, and he's, I would say he's, he's been affected mainly by um i think 50 percent of his portfolio is housing association that's not been affected at all the other 50 percent he has had um quite a lot of people come forward and say you know you're getting a mortgage holiday so we don't want to pay our rent and he's had to kind of explain and educate them that just because i'm getting a mortgage holiday doesn't mean i can let you have your rent not paid yeah. but potentially we can come to an agreement where you could sort of pay it over a bit of time or have a little break and we can add it and so that that, that conversation's happened to him quite a lot um yeah. i've also got a hmo client of mine who's got lots of rooms i think in total 200 odd in southeast um he's got lots of empty rooms at the minute and we're just people some 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 of the people that were um originally from abroad have just kind of up and gone and said, no, I, I, we don't want to be here. We'd rather be back home while this is all going on. So I, I think he said to me, he's about 20% empty vacancy in these rooms at the moment. So okay. I suppose that is a little bit scary for, you know, you're about to build an eight bed HMO and you need eight tenants and you, you've got potential some um, occupancy issues. But at the same time, I mean, what I did do, funnily enough, was I put an advert up on um, open rent and spare room dot Com with just a stock photo of one of my other rooms for this location and just put, popped it out there and I think I had 22 inquiries in two days for the room so there's definitely demand here for them so I think they'll well, go that's, that's but it's, yeah so I, but I'm interested it's interesting to know that your why would you say your your rooms have um, dropped in terms of rents is it just people are struggling to pay them or um, loss well, of jobs or what's the issue 
it's exactly what your client had. A lot of people were from overseas and uh, the ones that were coming to an end, because I, I always like to do fixed term tenancies so we don't get this whole, you know, one month nurse and they're gone. Um, yeah. But it just so happened that a few were up in, you know, March, April, yeah. May, whatever. Yeah. And they did indeed say, look, we're, we're going to go home or whatever. You know, they may have even left before the lockdown, just weeks before I paid the last month's rent and, and off they went. Mm -hmm. Um, so we had a good fair few like that. And then obviously once the room is empty, well, you can't fill it during lockdown at all because there was no movement whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, once the lockdown restrictions were lifted, we found that demand was really slow to come back because mm -hmm. people were very wary. You know, if they didn't have to move, they weren't moving. You know, yeah. I even had silly inquiries for, you know, someone wants to rent a room that was 600. I said, oh, where are you now? What are you paying? Oh, I'm paying six fifty, and she was in a much better location right next to the tube. And I said, well, surely you're not going to, you know, save any money because you're going to be traveling longer and further and your travel card and all for 50 quid. It's going to balance out the same anyway. Yeah. And she said, oh, I'll pull back. I never did. And then probably realized yeah. how stupid it sounded just to save 50 quid. And that, yeah. that was pretty much the only inquiry I had that month. So, you know, go figure. Um, yeah. All the rooms did let. We're full house now, but we're now early August, and the lockdown restrictions have been lifted for well a fair few months now. I think uh, was it middle of June? I forget now. The, the yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it was, so it's yeah. taken six weeks to get back to full house sort of thing. But yeah, we we dropped to sort of 80, 85 percent occupancy, whereas normally we're running on ninety seven, one hundred percent. The single yeah. let, as I mentioned, as you said, uh, they weren't very affected uh, in your own portfolio. They haven't in mind either, um, mainly because, you know, fixed term contract, they actually, uh, most of them expire from August, September, and yeah. a lot of rituals, a lot of people just want to stay put. And the ones that did want to move, um, had one find their own replacements, and another group of tenants took the other place straight away. So no, no problems. Yeah, really over. I, I just think that, you know, in, in the hierarchy of things, people that are renting rooms are just much more transient and much more, um, yeah, oh, great, I'll up sticks and leave. Yeah, and yeah, they sure. were quite difficult to fill because, you know, there's not a lot of movement in that sector of the market. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people that work in, um, uh, in hospitality, you know, like we had yeah. a coffee boy yeah. there who was working on Surbiton Station. Well, guess what? There's no commuters, so Nero close down their coffee shop on the station yeah yeah uh, and there's a lot of costos and neros that still aren't even open today yeah you know? you're right yeah it's just a commercial yeah. decision they just shut and you know the guy was 20 old he was from spain he just went back yeah. home to, yeah. to spain to sit with his friends oh, yeah. you know the whole yeah. london adventure and you know he can't go to school to improve his english and he can't work so what's the point of being here yeah 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 that makes sense like no, no strings attached with hmos isn't it? you can just up and leave whatever you want and because uh, i started to think uh, there's a lot of negative connotations towards hmos and i, I think you know it depends on which angle you go down if you're if you're going down the kind of real um housing association slash supported living type route you'll get a certain type of tenant which nothing wrong with that and if your property suits that in the right area or you put the right sort of fixtures and fittings then that can work my, i don't i yep. tend not to not to do that mine are more kind of nicely done up control your own heating in your own bedroom lovely furnishings to get yep. kind of professional working people but what when i started to think about this hmo in particular like filling the rooms and would i have any issues and i in the area that it is you can't rent a one bedroom flat for less than a thousand pounds per month say and then on top of that, you've got your council tax, your gas, your electric, your water, really you need an internet connection. And, you know, you're, you're probably spending 12, 50, 1300 pounds a month to have that property. So, so taking a room at 600 or 650 and having all your bills included for some people, especially oh. if they're, if they're going to be in a time of, you know, a bit of uncertainty and they don't know what's happening with their job and things like that. It, it may well be that we might get some more demand for our rooms, you know, if we are, dipping into a bit of a recession next year and that type of stuff so uh, it, it's a good room rate really good room rate i know other yeah. people that are renting out much more expensive rooms where um the, the the one bed prices are about the same to be fair yeah yeah uh, yeah you're offering really good value for money so where yeah. you offer good value for money I, I don't think you'll struggle to to fill the rooms and yeah 
again, we're on the same page there. My own H1 portfolio, all very nicely done. Yeah. Um, but the room rentals that I do, um, that's the rent to rent portfolio, they're a little bit more on the um, blue collar worker side of the yes. quality spectrum than, than my okay, own. Okay, sure, portfolio. yeah. But um, I, I think. Um, I, I like to think that um, uh, that there's a future for HMO rooms. Uh, that whole co-living thing is uh, is here to stay. A lot of people have been doubtful that um, people would want to continue to live together because of the whole COVID uh, spreading diseases. Other people will you know get out of my face sort of thing. But I do think that people are social creatures and people flock to people. I don't think that. HMO rooms are a fad whatsoever. So I think it's probably a very good, stable investment for the long term. Uh, your your yeah. HMO. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's it's difficult, isn't it? Because I I do think the quality of the room will determine who you you bring in. And so like the last yeah. the last HMO that I did, the doors all had pin operated entry. You just you went up to your, your door, you pop a pin in, you get in. Uh, and there's there's a sort of a bit of a controversy about whether you should have a telly in your, your bedroom. I put little 32 inch tellies on the walls in all the, the HMO rooms, little thermostat, there's lamps in there and I, I put dimmable spotlights and just try and, I, basically what I was trying to do is if I was going to live somewhere, would I be quite comfortable and safe living in here? You know, yeah. cleaner coming in and out probably as you're doing with some of your properties, keeping it nice and clean and maybe we might have to start thinking about how to COVID-19 proof these properties and do we put anti-back you know just in the front door and do we you know do something different to kind of make make people feel really safe when they're going in or do we have certain times that people can use the kitchen so it's not overcrowded and I hadn't really thought about that but it's, it's definitely something to think about for especially for it's the people that have got lots of rooms. It's such a pandemic environment that we have to think yeah. about that because we've got enough regulation to think about haven't we? I know. <laughs> But I suppose it's what feels, it's, it's whether someone feels safe as well, isn't it? Because if they feel safe, yeah. they're going to rent the room and they're going to stay there. So if, 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 if they come into a house and all eight people are in the kitchen and you know, there's no distance and they, they might not feel safe, I suppose. But yeah, you just have to be careful with that. Yeah. And, and what's safe for you is different for what's safe yeah. to me. And everyone's got a different perception on it, haven't they? But um... Obviously, yeah. But we digress. Well, listen, it's, it's been great having you on. I love your, um, your investment strategy. Now, if, uh, if someone wants to get in touch with you for uh, either investment advice or perhaps touch base on mortgages, how's best to get in touch with you, Omar? Yeah, sure. Okay, so um, my Instagram is at Ohms Under the Hammer, which is my kind of um, slogan name, if you like. Um, I'm on LinkedIn um, as Omer Mehmet. So you'll find me there. Uh, well, that's quite a popular name because it's almost like saying John Smith in Turkish. So you yeah, might, yeah. You might find a, a load of them. Uh, my email address is, is omer, O-M-E-R, at trinityfinance.co.uk. Um, so you can drop me an email if you like. Uh, my main website is www.trinityfinance.co.uk. Uh, as I said, we're based in Welling in Kent. So you should find me on Google and that sort of stuff as well. Awesome. And I'll pop that in the show notes below as well. So if anyone wants to get in touch with Omar, then, uh, then they can do so. So, uh, well, great. Thanks very much for being on the Down to South London podcast. Uh, once again, proving that investing in South London is uh, very popular and possible, um, moreover. So uh, thanks very much for coming on. And uh, we'll see each other in person soon, I hope. Yeah, perfect. Thanks so much for having me. No problem at all. All right, you take care. You too. Cheers. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe on Stitcher, SoundCloud or iTunes. And please do give a five-star review to help me reach others also. Are you looking to invest in London? Why not reach out to me to see how I can help you. See further information at www.yarunhopper.com.